The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. <clears throat> Hello and welcome back to the Occupational Therapy Australia webinar on sensory processing um, and impact on everyday life. And today's session is session number two. Um, as before, my name is Sandra Melbourne and I'm the National CPD Coordinator with Occupational Therapy Australia. just like to remind you all of the housekeeping points um, for this session. The webinar will run for about an hour and it is being recorded. Um, I have muted all attendees in order to prevent background noise from coming through. Um, if you've got any questions, just type them in the questions section as they come up uh, and they'll be answered at the time. Um, and we do encourage lots of questions and engagement, so yeah, it'd be fantastic if you can ask any questions that you have. Um, finally, there is an orange button in the corner of your control panel, which you may click in order to minimise the panel. Um, so now I'll just hand over to you, Melissa, all yours. Thank you. Welcome back everyone to webinar number two with Professor Winnie Dunn. Um, as I mentioned last week, my name is Melissa Kelly and I'm the unit coordinator of education and research regarding sensory processing in everyday life. So as Sandra mentioned, please do um, ask questions. We had some great comments as well last week and uh, I'm sure you heard Winnie was very um, welcoming of questions and she really appreciated feedback and if something had worked for you or, or if you'd never thought to try it before. So um, it, it makes for a really exciting webinar and also this is a rare opportunity so um, please, please do use that facility. Okay, I'll, um, I'll hand it over to you, introducing Professor Winnie Dunn. Oh, thanks, Melissa. Um, hi, I'm Winnie Dunn. I'm a professor and chair of the Occupational Therapy Program at the University of Kansas, which is in the United States. And although you are all starting your day, I am ending my day because it is 8 p.m. my time um, on Wednesday night, so I think I'm... Uh, I'm yet to have the day that you're already having. So uh, tonight our topic is uh, using the sensory profile two, particularly using the child sensory profile two. Last week we talked about a toddler and uh, the family's um, needs for support and this week we're going to be talking about um, a child and uh, next week we'll be talking about a child at school, so we'll have a combination of the um, school companion data and the parents data to give you an example of how that might look. So let's get started. If I can get my, there, get my slides to move. So this is Francine, and uh, Francine's five years old, and she lives with her parents and her sister in a home in the country. Francine's mother got to know one of the occupational therapists in the community when they served on a community board for a preschool program, and that became an important um, factor in what ends up happening with Francine and her family. So um, the mother uh, took uh, Francine to the doctor because after they moved to the country, Francine started to get sick um, every time that uh, she ran errands with Francine in the car. And so she went to the doctor to see if there was something medical or, or physiological that was happening to um, sort of trigger these, um, these uh, upset stomach and, and vomiting um, situations. Uh, the pediatrician um, evaluated Francine and um, she found out that there really wasn't anything particular that uh, that they could point to that would be uh, triggering or causing some of this, um, this uh, getting sick. And so the pediatrician suggested that, um, that Francine's mom uh, contact an occupational therapist to find out if there were any sensory factors that might be contributing to her reaction during those car rides. And this was fortuitous because the mom already knew an occupational therapist from working on this preschool board. And so she felt really comfortable uh, calling uh, this OT to either get help from her or to get a referral or some ideas about who else she could contact. And I think this is an important point that sometimes we forget as providers that um, it's very, you know, we feel really comfortable with all these people with different backgrounds and um, 
and that work in different kinds of settings, but um, being respectful of families about um, their uh, shyness or their discomfort with trying to approach somebody in a discipline they're not familiar with, um, much less somebody that they've never met. So uh, thinking about how to make those connections for families, in, in the case of Francine, the mom did have a connection, but it just points out that we want to be respectful and uh, sensitive about that as a feature of our um, process of giving families. We think we're giving them all these great resources, and if they feel uncomfortable making the contact, it doesn't do us any good. So the mom called the OT um, to see if she could have um, some ideas, and the OT actually said that she would be happy to uh, provide care and service for Francine and her family. So the first thing that um, obviously that the OT did, since our topic is looking at sensory processing, was to give uh, the, um, the mom uh, a copy of the child sensory profile too to fill out um, as a first step uh, in getting the conversation started. I think sometimes those of you who have used the sensory profile uh, would also agree that um, it's amazing how many ideas and um, questions and conversations start just from the idea of the family reading the items um, and saying to themselves, gosh, if it's on this test, there must be other families that have talked about this. So they, it sort of opens the door to conversation um, in addition to providing you with some standardized um, assessment. So after um, she got the sensory profile two back from the family, she also decided she needed to interview um, the parents to find out a little bit more detail about this uh, car riding situation. And so um, they, when she talked to the mom and dad, she found out that um, Francine did fine when she went on errands with her dad, but she had trouble when she was running errands with her mother. So um, This is an interesting point because we could go in a lot of directions right now, couldn't we? We could say something psychosocial about you know, her loving to be with her dad and not liking to be with her mother. Uh, there's lots of ideas that we might start to generate, but um, what the OT uh, decided to do is to just talk to the parents in a little bit more detail. It's kind of like doing an activity configuration about car riding. You know, a lot of times we think about doing activity analysis on uh, the schedule of the day or on a particular thing, but here we have um, two similar activities that have something about them that's unique, and we need to get down to the details. So this is a, a little bit different application of our skills in activity analysis. So uh, when she talked to the parents about the car rides uh, that they take during the week, she found out that while Francine gets sick, uh, she vomits after about um, any rides with the mother that are longer than 15 minutes. Um, and she doesn't get that, doesn't have that situation with um, her rides with her dad. So um, the she's going to want to find out some more details about what that looked like um, in addition to looking at the sensory profile data. So does anybody have any questions about just that sort of basic information before we move on? Nothing's come through so far, Winnie. Okay. Well, then we'll go on to the next thing. Good. Okay. So um, here is the, here's the data um, summarized. Um, mostly it's in this format because uh, this format fits on the screen. And... Uh, so I want to just point out at the top we have much less than others, less than others, just like others, more than others, and much more than others. So um, if you can imagine that those five categories um, fit the bell curve, which much, with much less and much more being the tails of the bell curve and the just like others part of this graph being the fat part of the bell curve. So about 68% of the kids are going to fall into the just like others, and then about 14 to 16% are going to fall in the less side, and about 14 to 16% are going to fall on the more side. And so um, this gives us an idea of how 
uh, Francine is performing in relation to uh, her particular peer group. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. We'll look at um, different parts of it, um, one thing at a time. So I'm going to highlight. Uh, the first thing that I always like to do is to look at the scores that are just like the child's peers. So in this case, we see that Francine has several scores that are just like her peers. She has, um, in a sensory category, she has touch and oral sensory processing um, patterns that are just like her peers. Um, in the behavioral category, social um, interaction and attention are both uh, just like her peers. And then when we get down to the sensory patterns, she has both avoiding and seeking just like her peers. So this triggers um, us to think about um, a few more in-depth ideas. Um, again, we're always trying to think about what the information we're gathering is helping us to um, you know, make a hypothesis or to come up with ideas about where we, what questions we might ask or where we might need to go next. So one of the things that I see here um, that's important in Francine's cases, that avoiding and seeking, if you look at uh, Dunn's sensory processing framework, um, what avoiding and seeking have in common is that they both are active self-regulation strategies. So what that means is that children that have um, this kind of pattern um, have a likelihood of engaging in behaviors to manage their own sensory processing. So, so Francine is engaging in behaviors to manage her own sensory processing similarly to how her peers do it. So this is important for us to think about since we're having this um, getting sick in the car situation, um, which is a, a situation that a five-year-old doesn't have as much control over. So that's like a little idea that I'm going to tuck in the back of my mind to um, just keep coming back to and asking, you know, how could we use that um, knowledge about Francine's need, to, um, you know, the, that her pattern is just like others on this um, managing her own input. Because seekers manage their own input by trying to make more sensation for themselves, and um, children who have avoiding patterns uh, do things to try to reduce the amount of sensory input. But in both cases, they're trying to actively engage to get just the right amount of sensory input. And in the car, children, um, depending on how we organize the car ride, might not have as many um, opportunities to control their own sensory input. So that's a little idea I'm going to tuck in the back of my mind. So then if we um, go on, uh, the next thing that I, I notice here is that um, Francine has a more than others and a much more than others score in the patterns of uh, movement, which is the vestibular system, and in body position, which is basically vestibular input, or excuse me, proprioceptive input. So um, this, isn't a, 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 this is not a surprising finding considering what the parents have told the occupational therapist about the car rides. So here's another opportunity where the occupational therapist is coming up with a, a hypothesis. So she hypothesizes that um, Francine might be getting either inaccurate or unreliable information about her body in space and her body as it moves through space and that this might be contributing to her reactions while she's riding in the car. But of course, we're going to have to get some more details. You know, um, when we're working as occupational therapists, we're always coming up with hypotheses. And, um, you know, we don't have to have, we don't have to always come up with the correct hypothesis, but we do have to generate several hypotheses so that we can really, um, as we get more details, hone in on the hypothesis that is the most likely to be true. Um, at the beginning, we might have several hypotheses, and they all might seem reasonable, but then as we gather more information, we can narrow down our ideas, and that's how we create um, really effective and refined interventions, because we've really considered 
the whole range of options available and we've narrowed ourselves down onto one or two things that we're going to really focus on because we have the data to support our decision. So um, let's, let's go on and see. Um, we also see that she has more than other score on auditory processing and visual processing. And when we um, combine all this sensory information, um, we see that Francine's patterns um, are contributing perhaps to her registration score. Let me look down here. Yeah, her registration score and her sensitivity score. So um, if you are not familiar with the sensory profile too and how it works, these scores at the bottom, avoiding and registration and seeking and sensitivity, those are patterns of sensory processing. But those scores are comprised of scores from all these sensory systems and behavioral things up above. So when we have a more than other score in registration and in sensitivity, we, um, we know if we look at the details, which we don't have the whole sensory profile in front of us, but it's likely that the scores um, that are in the more than others and much more than others categories up above are the ones that are contributing to this registration and sensitivity pattern. So the OT looked at the actual items, and I do that frequently when I'm trying to decide which sensory systems are contributing to these patterns, because they don't all contribute to every single pattern. Um, frequently, there'll be one or two sensory systems that are contributing more to a particular score here at the bottom. So when, um, when OT looked at the scores, um, she saw that the auditory system was contributing more to the sensitivity pattern that we see at the bottom, and that the body position items were more contributory to the registration patterns. So what this means is that, um, that, that um, Francine's auditory system is behaving in a more sensitive way, and the registration, which we remember, the, uh, the registration score means um, that the child is missing more stimuli than other children. So um, since body position is contributing to that registration score, what we can imagine is that Francine's uh, body position or, or proprioceptive information is, um, is either slow or inaccurate, and so her ability to interpret where her body is in space is going to be lower, which will make her look perhaps more clumsy or um, uh, she might have delayed reactions to things. So these are all ideas that we're going to want to hold on to so we can sort out this situation uh, that Francine um, is having. So um, with all these different ideas um, in front of us here, um, I, I thought about, you know, I had a hypothesis about um, the body position and the movement, but I thought, you know, what are some other hypotheses that we could um, generate based on the data we have so far? Um, not necessarily all of them true, but, but that are reasonable considering the data that's in, that's in front of us. So um, I'm going to just pause for one minute and let you jot down. You don't have to... Um, send it in or anything, but just jot down a couple of ideas that you might have, and then I'm going to tell you, I actually came up with five different possible hypotheses. So I'm just going to pause for a moment so you can write something down. Does anyone um, want to share? <laughs> I haven't had anyone brave enough yet. <laughs> okay, that's all right. Um, I think everyone's waiting to see what the expert says. <laughs> I'm sure that everybody's written down all of the ones I'm going to say. So um, you can give yourselves a little star next to the, your ideas when I say them. <laughs> um, so, so the first one is the one I already said, which is that um, her body, um, body position and movement um, stimuli are giving her either inaccurate or unreliable information about her body. Um, the second one that I came up with was 
that her visual and auditory input um, are not giving her accurate information for environmental mapping. So if we think about um, body position and touch information, they tell us information about our, the, our body, where our body is in space, where the edge of our body is. But auditory and visual information gives us information about the environment. Um, you know, the sound comes from a distance and visual input is outside of us. We certainly bring that information in through our, our sensory systems, but um, the truth is that from a, from a neuroscience standpoint, the auditory and visual systems are helping us to map the world around us. So that second hypothesis would be that the environmental mapping is off, um, and our first hypothesis is that the body mapping is off. So my third um, hypothesis was, um, I wonder if eating a snack, which would engage her touch and oral sensory processing, right, because she'd be holding the snack, looking at the snack, uh, chewing, tasting, all the things that oral sensory processing involves. I'm, I'm wondering whether that would help the car rides, taking advantage of those aspects as her personal strengths. Um, so it's something I'm going to want to follow up on with the family. And then my fourth hypothesis is um, I'm wondering how the um, auditory and body position information, since we know those are the two things contributing to registration and sensitivity, how are they contributing to the car rides? Is there something about the way the sounds are in the mother's car and the dad's car. Is there something about um, how her seating is in those two cars that I need to understand a little bit more about? So I'm going to probe about that because I wonder if uh, we could make some um, adaptations in the car that would be helpful to her. And having this data from the sensory profile gives me the idea that maybe that's something I can look into as well. And then my final hypothesis is related to what I told you earlier about seeking and avoiding. Um, she is not in control on these car rides, and I'm wondering if there's some way that, um, if that's part of what's contributing to her difficulty in the mother's, in the mother's car, um, how does that contribute, and what could we do to change the activities that, that are going on during the ride that might support um, a better outcome since we have, um, just like other scores, on seeking and avoiding, which tell us that her ability to manage her own sensory systems for some aspects, like touch and oral processing, are just like her peers. So those are all the ideas that I've come up with. Um, the body position and body scheme being act inaccurate or unreliable, the visual and auditory input, um, maybe giving her inaccurate or unreliable information about the world around her, um, wondering whether taking advantage of her strengths in touch processing and oral processing uh, by having a snack sort of routine in the car, if that would help, um, wondering how auditory and body position are contributing to the car ride, um, and then finally, uh, this issue of whether having some control over things during the car ride might make a difference. Okay, so does anybody have any questions or comments about the hat? Uh, Winnie, we had one comment about loving the idea of a snack and how it's strength-based. Oh, um, good. The, yeah, good. And the other question that we had was about um, the visual input. So somebody wanted to know if um, the intensity of the input that she's receiving could change the way she's experiencing that car ride. So, for example, you gave the idea of looking down at the snack. So would that potentially be less um, overwhelming for her than looking out the window? I think I've interpreted the question oh, right. Oh, wow, that is great. That's great thinking. That's a great idea. And that's yeah. something that we're going to want to hone in on. See, that this is the kind of stuff that we think about when we're looking, you know, at the preliminary um, information we get and the sensory profile to try to say to ourselves, what are some good 
reflective questions we can ask the parents and, and even to get them to try some things to see if it's better. Because looking at the snack does narrow the field down and if the big visual environment is overwhelming, that, I mean, I, I can certainly see how that scanning of the big environment, uh, the, the sort of um, pulsing visual input that goes by on the side, you know, looking out the side of the window, all those things could um, be factors, and that's a that is great. That is a great sort of nuance on that hypothesis. It is, yeah. And I've I've just had one more come through. Sorry, I'm just trying to open I'll it. I apologize. This is what's fun about this. Okay, so all right. Sorry, I'm just trying. To, my screen popped down, and now I'm just trying to open it in full window. I'll, when you'll jump in, when I can open it again, is that okay? Oh, that's fine. No big deal. Okay, so we got all these hypotheses rolling around in our head. So, so now we're going to have to um, start exploring with the parents so that we can confirm or reject all these different hypotheses. You know, and it isn't that we're going to necessarily have one, but the five or six ideas that we have are going to give us some guidance about how to ask the questions and what direction to go, and we might end up with actually a hybrid idea after we uh, gather some more information. So, so the thing that was bugging the OT, and certainly bugs me when I look at this case, is that she's doing fine with dad and she's having trouble with mom. You know, so, so the first, you know, I'm sure you're all wondering um, about that. So the first thing uh, that the OT did was find out what cars they drive. So, drum roll because this is highly dramatic. Here are the cars. So the top car is dad's car and the bottom car is mom's car. So she's doing fine with dad and she's having trouble with mom um, when they run errands that last more than 15 minutes. And you know this 15 minute thing is important in this family's story because they live in the country. You know, if they lived in town, um, and, and um, it said in the case study that, um, you know, they had just moved to the country. So it's likely that Francine has had this possible difficulty, but it never came up because if they lived close into town, they didn't have to go on big, long car rides to run errands and do the everyday things that families do. So this is starting, it looks like a new uh, challenge, but it might be a challenge that was running underneath. It was, um, it was hiding from us because the contextual features weren't um, exposing it or shining a light on it. Um, so I'm going to give you another minute to write down, um, like, what are, you know, just from an activity configuration or an activity analysis standpoint, what are things just seeing the pictures, just seeing the pictures, what are some things that you notice that are likely different for riding with dad and riding with mom, just seeing the pictures of the cars. So I'll give you about, I'll give you about a minute or 30 seconds to think about that. Okay, so um, an obvious and silly one is that the dad's car's red and the mom's car's blue. Um, um, I know that sounds silly, but sometimes, you know, if you talk to a family and say, well, let's talk about what's different about, about the two cars. You know, I, I've had families say, well, you know, she doesn't really like blue or, you know, they say kind of um, things that might seem silly, but when we're doing family-centered care, we say, okay, you know, that might be a feature. Let's get that down and, and consider it in our big story. So when we talk to the family, to the parents, a little bit longer about this, um, the dad's routine basically involved Francine sitting in a child safety seat in the front seat of the passenger seat of his car. Dad plays country music. And he and Francine sing along to the music while he's driving. 
And sometimes dad plays. Um, we call it I Spy. It's the game where um, one person says I spy uh, something red, or I spy a dog, or um, you know, just something that they see as they're driving. And then the other person says, Oh, I see it too. So uh, they would play I Spy back and forth when they were driving. <coughs> Excuse me. So. And that's kind of a, a little bit of a, a picture of what it looks like when dad's driving. And when mom drives, um, she rides in a safety seat in the back seat of the car. And uh, mom's typical thing to do is to give Francine a book to read. Um, mother also turns on music, but she said she's more likely to play like instrumental or orchestra type music uh, rather than the kind of... Um, sing-along uh, country music that dad plays. Okay, so um, again, let's pause for a moment. Like With that information, how does that help you to kind of go through those hypotheses and think about, okay, so what does that mean? How do I narrow down on my ideas? So for example, one of the things I think about is, um, you know, we have that idea that came out a little bit earlier about looking down uh, being more helpful, but here we have a situation where um, in Dad's car, uh, Francine's looking out because they might, you know, cause sometimes they're playing I Spy, whereas in Mom's car, she uh, Francine is more likely um, to be looking down at her book. So that makes me wonder if, um, you know, being able to keep track of. You know, people that, that get motion sick, for example, are always looking out at the horizon. They're looking outside to sort of keep um, a, a consistent pattern in their mind about what's going on in the environment around them. And that looking down while they're in the car can make them feel a little bit more unsettled. Um, so I'm going to pause here and tell you <laughs> something. Um, I can't help myself sometimes, uh, just a little neuroscience fact. So when people get car sick, um, one of the things that we have to think about is that there is a there is a need in your brain to reconcile or to to compare the input you're getting from three sources, from um, your eyes, the retina, and the things you see with your eyes, but also the muscles of your eyes and um, your body posture, which would be proprioception, and the muscles in your eye would be proprioception. And then also from the vestibular organs, or the, um, the organs that tell us about our relationship to gravity and movement. So um, those three kinds of input kind of, they come in from the sensory organs, and they, um, they, uh, they come into the brainstem, and basically your brain is trying to sort out, am I moving? Is my head moving? Is the world moving? You know, is my body moving? Is my head moving? Is the world moving? And so when people get car sick, um, a lot of times um, one of the reasons is because they can't reconcile those three questions. I want you to think about a time when you've sat like in a parking lot and uh, you're getting ready to turn your car on to back out and all of a sudden you get that queasy feeling because it, you think you've, your car's moving and you realize the car next to you has moved. I'm sure some of you have had that experience. Well, that's that, that's that little moment is when your brain is not reconciling. You know, it doesn't feel like you're moving, but your visual system is saying, oh my God, there's movement. And so that, that lack of reconciliation is, is um, a, a place where people have that sensation of motion sickness. Um, and since she's getting sick in the car, you know, it's something for us to think about. So, so when uh, she's looking out and playing I Spy with Dad, she's not getting sick. And when she's sitting in the back seat of the car with Mom, looking down at a book, she is more getting sick getting car sick. So, so now we have another idea about how the visual system is contributing. Um, I also think about the difference between sitting in the back seat and sitting in the front seat. What can you see from the back seat compared to what you can see from the front seat? Those of you who do have motion sickness, you like to be in the front seat. 
More importantly, what would you like to do? You would like to be the driver. Well, a five-year-old can't be the driver, but you know, it also makes me think that being in the back seat is, uh, which mom is doing because she thinks it's a safer place for her daughter, um, but maybe being in the front seat, you know, so it makes me think that maybe being in the front seat is going to be a better idea. Winnie, may I jump in? Oh, sure. Yeah, so we've had, um, actually, people are, are really thinking along the same lines, which is great. Um, so I had some comments uh, about, you know, we would need to look at um, positions in the car, and then you've obviously gone and talked about that and what, what she's doing in the car. So um, it's been nice to hear that as well. Um, and also consideration of, you know, the looking down and the looking up is obviously going to alter the vestibular input that she's receiving as well. Um, as well as somebody saying that even the different routes that each parent is taking. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah. You know, a guy that drives a red truck um, from the country is likely to take a different route. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Through the cornfields. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there's some of that that they're not telling mom about. <laughs> Good old dad. Um, so, and the other question that somebody has asked is how, how do we sort of differentiate this from classic motion sickness? Well, you know, um, we don't. We don't necessarily. Um, but motion sickness is the result of, of um, the sensory input being discordant in the brain. You know, like that's part of what contributes to somebody feeling motion sick. When people get motion sick in a, in a boat, you know, they tell them to go outside and look at the horizon. You know, they're trying to get, to get those things back into, um, into uh, synchrony with each other. So, um, you know, this could be, uh, you know, it's funny because we don't necessarily say motion sickness with kids as much as we do with adults. Um, but that could be part of what's going on here. But, but I, for me, that is still a sensory feature um, where that lack of reconciliation is happening. Okay, great. Thank you. And then I've just had another comment come through saying that, yeah, they've, that you're glad that you've explained that because um, in their own experience that they've always found that looking looking down has in, intensified their, their feeling of queasiness. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, it's people, people are obviously really relating to, to the examples, so that's great. Oh, that's good. You know, and here's the thing, like these parents, and this is, a, this is the gift we have to give as OTs. You know, these parents aren't thinking anything about dad playing I spot, mom looking at a, at a you know, mom thinks a book is, is um, quiet and restful. You know, like they're, they're not, they don't know how to analyze the task the way you and I do, that, that that act of doing something that mom perceives as very quiet and restful um, is actually potentially disruptive. You know, and so part of what we're, the gift we're giving families when we talk about sensory processing is that that gift of insight about those little things mattering to the outcome so that the parents, we're arming them, that we're making them more competent to problem solve in the future by giving them those little details along the way. Um, so another thing that happened in this conversation with the mom and dad was um, Mom made a comment about the dad's suspension in his car, and he, she, had the word she used was it was stronger. She said she said the suspension was stronger, and so you don't notice as much of the changes in the road while you're riding in dad's car. So that's an, that was interesting. As we were having this conversation, we were we were inviting these parents to think more deeply about this. Thing that they don't think much about, which is the car ride. So, um, so mom starts offering, and that's what happens when you open a space up for people to have a conversation about a, a, a simple everyday activity. They start thinking more deeply about it, and I, I think it's really thrilling when a family says something as simple as, you know, riding it, riding in, you know, my husband's car is is very different, you know, it's very solid and you don't feel the road and, you know, it, like that's a really, it's a really good insight for that mom to have. So um, I just want to point out that, again, just like last week, 
some of the things we do because of our knowledge about sensory processing aren't specifically about the sensory feature. You know, that was that's really a, a like a cognitive behavioral kind of idea of the moms. You know, that, oh, you know, our cars ride differently. You know, maybe that's affecting Francine. So um, the other thing that the OT talked about with the parents was um, the difference in the visual and auditory experiences. We've talked about the visual experiences. But um, here is a situation where moms, again, you know, she thinks she's creating a relaxing environment. She has this nice orchestra. Or Orchestra type music in the background, and um, but but and perhaps it's making um, it, it's more um, kind of fading to the background. It's not it's not really uh, contributory, um, but in fact the dad having Francine sing along with the with the songs is engaging her in a cognitive way, which is helping her to manage the car ride a little bit better. So her interactions are more active in the dad's car ride situation, and they seem more passive in the mom's car ride situation. So if we go back to um, Francine wanting to have more control, or if her nervous system um, sort of acting in a way where having control is a good thing, um, the dad's scenario has more features that are about having control or management over the situation. Does that make sense to everybody? I think silence is, is a good thing here. Must be. Okay. I don't have any further questions. <laughs> <laughs> so who thought we could have this many minutes of conversation about cars and car rides with children? But um, <laughs> here we are. Uh, this, is what, this is what Family Centered Care looks like. Okay, so if we... Um, uh, have, add up all this information, um, the OT, and, and when you're doing um, kind of a coaching type intervention, uh, you always want to end uh, any conversation with a plan. You want to say to the parents, you know, what would you like to try? You know, we have lots of ideas out here. Um, we don't know. You know, all of them could be contributing, or maybe only some of them are contributing. We don't really know yet. And so, um, especially with a story like this one where there's so many factors that could be contributing. So after kind of reviewing them and when the OT was talking to the parents, um, you know, you, you would um, keep reflecting back to the data from the child sensory profile. You know, we see that uh, she responds differently to visual and auditory input, so we're going to want to consider how that plays into the story. You know, we're going to go back and forth because we want the parents to start internalizing all those factors about Francine, so when they encounter a new situation, they're going to be um, ready to make some good decisions. So they, um, she asked the parents, you know, what they what they would like to try, and the mom said uh, playing country music was out of the question because um, the dad, of course, suggested that why don't we both do that since that's something dad likes. You can hear that conversation, can't you? Uh, but she said that she was willing to try uh, some rhyming songs with Francine uh, that she learned in preschool um, as a way to be more active the way Dad was playing I Spy. So, um, again, that, that is, it sounds like a really simple thing for Mom to suggest, but underneath that comment is the Mom's deep processing, deep listening to what we're talking about, you know, uh, that we're talking about Francine doing better when she has active engagement, when she gets to help participate in the situation. So the idea that she said um, we can do some rhyming songs in the car was a really good, a really good idea. Um, she thought that would um, kind of get them interacting in a way that was more consistent with how Francine and Mom's relationship looked, rather than sort of. Um, abdicating her relationship with Francine and doing it the way Dad was going to do it. So they decided that they would try that, and then they would um, kind of touch base the next week to see what was going to happen. Anybody have any questions or comments about about that? Nothing at the moment, Winnie. I think everyone's okay. just keen to say what you've um, what you're going to suggest. Okay. Okay, so when they then when they meet again um, or talk on the phone, whichever you know, 
um, remember uh, the families in the country, and so um, they could also meet by Skype, they could meet by uh, another web conferencing, they could meet by telephone. Um, so when we say meet, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually seeing each other in the flesh. They might be doing it some other way. So when they meet the next week, mom says that um, um, she and Francine had fun doing the rhyming songs. Um, she still got sick in the car. So um, again, we're going back to what the goal was, was um, Francine not getting sick in the car. And so um, mom and dad had talked about that, and um, mom decided she just wasn't, you know, for, for the time being, because she was feeling a little bit concerned about, um, you know, just Francine feeling ill and not wanting to kind of exacerbate that. So she decided that she would limit the, the types of errands that she ran with Francine and um, try to figure out ways for when, um, when she's with Francine to stay home or to do shorter trips because remember the, um, the trips that cause the problems are the ones that last more than 15 minutes. So if they were running to a neighbor's house or they were running to the corner store, um, the shorter rides uh, mom would continue to do, um, but that, uh, that uh, she just wouldn't, wouldn't do the long ones for a while. And so through some additional conversation, Dad said um, that he would take uh, responsibility uh, when Francine had to or wanted to go on errands, that he would take responsibility for being the person that um, she rode with. And um, so that was, that was how this family decided to manage this. Now, I know for some of us, we're like, we want to get to the bottom of this, and we want to figure this out, and, um, and so it might not feel as satisfying for the parents to decide, you know, well, dad's going to run the errands whenever Francine has to go and mom's going to stay home. But um, again, we have to say, you know, what is going to help the family feel like they're in charge of how their life goes and, and what's going to happen. And we do know that uh, sometimes as children get bigger, um, Francine's five, you know, when she gets a little bit bigger and she can, um, you know, see out, we, we see that um, engaging and being more active and being able to see outside, uh, maybe as she gets bigger that'll change, but we've armed the family with some ideas that they can watch for as time passes. Um, so so um, that was what they decided and they felt, they felt completely satisfied with that. Um, uh, so even though you and I might want to like keep going because we want to know, um, we have to we have to also um, like leave the door open in case they want to talk about it again, but also feel satisfied ourselves that we have um, helped the family uh, come to a solution that was acceptable to them. So with that sort of um, uh, punctuation on the original situation. Uh, I want us to think about some other activities that might also be challenging for this family going forward. So she's five, she's going to be getting, um, you know, a little bit older, um, being interested in a, a wider range of activity. So I'll give you a minute to just jot down what are some other family activities um, that might also start having some, uh, some challenges crop up for the same configuration of reasons that we've just talked about related to the car rides. I'll give you a minute to think about that. Okay, anybody have ideas? Um, I haven't had, I've had a couple of people wanting to just um, ask a, a couple of clarification oh, points. Okay. I think they think, you, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'll just, well, um, a couple of things popped up in that time. So uh, just a simple, a, a few sort of simple strategies that people were wondering if they did, um, things like, uh, did, did mum in the end let Francine sit in the front and also, um, 
you know, do they do things like opening a, f a window for fresh air? And um, also, oh, I'll, I'll let you answer that and then I'll, I might go on to the next one. Yeah, those, those are also really good ideas. Um, this family uh, felt settled having dad run the errands, uh, you know, and you, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Like, what's going on? And, you know, why was dad so willing to do that? And mom so willing to let him? And, um, but but I those are those are exactly the ideas I thought of. You know, could we uh, could we put a car seat in the front seat of the of the uh, blue car, um, and would that give her more visual field? Um, you know, the blue car is lower too. You know, so getting her up inside that seat would be really good. And the fresh air is a really good idea. Those are those are all good ideas that that um, you know we can offer families. But we also have to be respectful of the choices that they make. And uh, sure. in the case of this particular mother, you know, she was a little bit reluctant to put Francine in the front seat. And um, you know, uh, I think it, I think it would have helped. Um, but uh, she was reluctant to do it. So I, I love you know, you leave the door open, <laughs> yeah. not to make a fun for cars. <laughs> And I think in, in our case in Australia, and I know at least in WA, you, kids can't sit in the front seat until I think they're after eight. Oh, so, eight? I think it's yeah. six. Yeah. Six. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 But the, but those are you know from a you know this is like one of those things where we do a lot of internal thinking about something, and then we then we have our outside voices and we talk about what's possible. Yeah. So that's a definite yeah. pragmatic feature that we have to keep in mind. Um, and Winnie, sorry if I may as well. Somebody said in in this case, would you uh, would you ever get the parents to fill in a sensory profile for themselves? You know, if, yeah. if yeah, yeah, that's always you know um, that is always a really great idea. I think because it um, it it makes uh, how can I explain this? It makes the information not be about something wrong with Francine. You know, it makes it be about human beings yeah. because then mom will say oh Sam I knew you were I knew you were always like that or you know of course you don't pay attention or you know whatever it is like it starts creating some uh, family uh, information or lore that uh, that the family can use to understand how their um, everyday negotiations happen I, I always think it's a great idea they um, it helps everybody accept each other as we are, you know, instead of wanting somebody to be different. Sure. Yeah, it shares the responsibility or the... Exactly. The, that's, yeah. that's a great way of putting it. Yeah. So um, what are some of the activities? So the, the things I thought of, um, I think they're, you know, and this is a conversation that I would have with this family, you know, let's think about the things that made the car ride um, easier for fencing and harder for fencing. <clears throat> Even though the parents picked for dad to run the errands, we still can have the conversation that, you know, her not being able to see out and, um, you know, being actively engaged out, you know, outside the car visually and, and talking and singing and all that. We can talk about all those things, but we can think about things like she's five, you know, in the next particularly five to, to eight years, there's going to be an increasing number of recreational activities available to this child. And so to get the parents kind of sensitized to what recreational activities might be harder or easier for her or what um, conversations they might want to have, like if she wants to be on a team um, with the coach or with the, the person that she's learning from to, to make sure they watch for some of the early signs that might make something difficult. For example, um, you know, I wonder what would happen with uh, tumbling or karate or swimming. You know, some of those things might be fine and some of those things, you know, they just need to, for, for the parents to feel comfortable with, with Francine participating, we might want to say, you know, you might want to, you know, just give the, give the coach some tips about, you know, things to watch out for, what, what, Francine does when she starts feeling ill, or uh, what sort of things to tell Francine to um, tell her coach about. Uh, so I thought about recreation. 
Um, I also, you know, especially like if the family likes to go camping or something where they have long rides, making sure that they use the use vehicles that are acceptable. Um, I thought about play dates um, and uh, you know, sending Francine off with another family without talking to them about this situation and making sure you know what vehicle they're using and making sure it has some of the characteristics or the ride has some characteristics like dad's ride. And the other thing I thought about uh, because she's, she's going to be entering public school is um, field trips. You know, making sure that uh, the teachers and the teachers' aides, um, you know, know like you know where they might where might be the best place to sit her on the bus. Um, you know, getting Francine strategies for looking out the window or talking or singing or whatever um, to try to you know mediate those activities so she doesn't feel embarrassed or isolated um, about participating. Did people come up with other ideas? Um, there were, we had some ideas like, you know, going on the swings, merry-go-round, oh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, some more kind of practical things based around the car, um, but I think, I, I feel like you moved from that and we were thinking about, um, you know, additional things that we could do. So, yeah, train rides, um, and yeah, there was, there oh, was the a train, few, that's, a, that's that a great ideas. one. Yeah, it's a good one, isn't it? So. That's a good one. Yeah, because um, you know you can be in a train and and uh, be in the middle and not look out, and and it could be very troublesome. But you know, here's the thing. You know, right now we're going to be, you know, arming the the parents with information so they can share with other caregivers, the profession, you know, the teachers and other people, family, other families that she might go spend time with. But then as Francine gets to be seven and eight and nine. We need to also make sure Francine has insight about those characteristics for herself so that she can say, you know, I do better if I sit in the front. I do better if I sit by the window. Um, mm -hmm. And luckily there's only two kids so they can both have a window. You know how that can be in a yeah. family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right, so <laughs> any other comments or questions? Um, yeah, just people still coming in with some additional ideas, you know, oh, along right. the same kind of things. Yeah, boat rides. Um, oh, and, and boat. Lots of, yeah, I guess that would um, that would be something to work towards, and and some things for the future as well, like some good ideas, um, more challenging, I suppose, vestibular experiences for her in the future. Yeah, yeah, really good thinking. But that, but to me, that's 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 like the nice thing is we need to think about the present, kind of resolve it, understand it a little better, but then use those tools, use those ideas to help the family do planning. So they, you know, our job is to make the family feel more competent and um, in trying to um, face those challenges um, without us around, you know, with, with the, the wisdom that they have gained from being around us, but not with us having to be there all the time. That's right. I haven't had anything else come through at the moment. So, and I okay. think that, that. But I was going. I, I, I'm here. What I'm, I've heard uh, you say across both is that yeah, it's really about empowering the parents and making them feel like they're doing a good job, you know, for their child, which we all know is is extremely important. So it's um, it's nice to hear that flow across both case studies. Yeah. Well, let me just give you a little preview for next week then. Um, we're going to talk to Tar about Tarek. Uh, Tarek's a third grader um, who's becoming more socially isolated, and so we're going to um, look at his uh, sensory profile school companion and his teacher, but we're also going to combine that with information from the parents to show how um, that parent and teacher partnership can be fostered by uh, the wisdom and insights of an occupational therapist uh, contributing uh, to their thinking. So mm, that sounds great. Well, that's um, next week. Yeah, that sounds really good. And actually, Winnie, sorry, somebody has just um, has come through oh. and said, did did you end up trying um, the snacks or the other oral input? And we wasn't... did not. No, we did not try it. Um, but but we did talk to the family about it. So you know th that's something they might try. Um, they, they, did not, they did not. Did not select to do it. Okay. 
All right, that's great. Thank you. So they've got it. They've got it in their toolkit if they need it. I suppose is the way to look at that, isn't it? Exactly. Lovely. All right. So is that you done, Winnie? And I'll I'll end up. I'll um finish up. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much again. So I certainly got a lot out of that, and um and it was really lovely to see all the questions and comments coming through. So and uh, yeah, we look forward to hearing about Tarek next week in a school setting. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next Thursday morning. And a reminder, email will be sent out, and the recording I think will be sent out as well uh, later on today. Thank you. Yay! <laughs> Thanks.